Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled today are filmmaker Peter Hansen and actor Philip Anthony Rodriguez. Michigan native Peter Hansen went to NYU and State University at Albany. As a film student, he learned the ins and outs of filmmaking from the bottom up. He also learned the ins and outs of journalism from the bottom up. Now, we have Peter with us, and he's an author, a filmmaker, um, and what else? Journalist, photographer, pretty much anything in the creative field short of music. I've tried it to some degree of success. So let's start with your life as a student at NYU. Is that uh, how you got into filmmaking? I got into filmmaking at a very early age. What I didn't do that a lot of uh, burgeoning filmmakers do is the Super 8 films when you're a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't do that? I did them in the youngest years, the youngest years when I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh -huh. But in terms of my serious efforts, I fiddled around a little bit toward the end of, of high school. But the base that I built for myself that ended up being really beneficial was a stronger base in writing. So I was very involved in student journalism. Oh, so and then you went, did you go to SUNY after that? I went to SUNY after NYU. Yeah. It's kind of convoluted, as is yeah, the case how, for a lot of other people. It's, it was the opposite, wasn't it? I did what I thought was going to be a straight trajectory of going to NYU to be a filmmaker and then the world was going to be waiting to see my wonderful movies and would open up for me like an oyster. Yes. Uh, it closed up for me like a clam instead. <laughs> so I fell back on what I had already been doing of student journalism and became a professional journalist and that turned into a career for 10 years that led to a couple of books. But I, being a professional journalist is not the easiest thing to do when you come out of school. You, you worked in a small um, community. Mm -hmm. Where was that? Albany, New York. Oh, it was where your where your college was. My second college. Yeah, yes. your second college. Was it easy for you to get a job then? No, I did what everybody else has to do in any kind of creative field, which is you take the free work and that turns into the paid exactly. work. So I started uh, reviewing movies for a small community paper, and within a few years, I was the editor of that paper. Oh, I see. So, so. You were reviewing movies. That was part of what you were interested in anyway. Yes. So you must have been very good at it. And you got a column out of, before you became editor, I guess, right? Sure. I got into journalism for the most superficial and selfish of reasons, which is I discovered in high school that if I was a reviewer, I didn't have to pay to see movies. And that sounded like a pretty good deal to me. Sounds good. <laughs> And it ended up being a really logical expansion of my film school education because if you're engaging with what works and what doesn't work in mainstream commercial filmmaking, you're doing essentially the same classwork you would be doing in film school. You're taking things apart and you're trying to figure out how the engine works. Exactly. Well, you wrote a lot of screenplays then. After that? Yes. And, and where did you go? Where were you living when you started writing these screenplays that became... Um, I don't know, prominent, let's say. Sure. After I finished school in NYU, and finished is sort of a fancy way of saying that I ran out of money, <laughs> I made some amateur films in New York. Didn't really get anywhere with that. Retreat were they short films? Short films. They were short films, which is very trendy mm -hmm. now. And you were doing it, what, 10, 15 years ago? Either time frame when it wasn't trendy. When it wasn't. <laughs> Because it is trendy now, isn't it? Because this was before the digital era, so you didn't really have the same kind of output. You couldn't put them on the net. You couldn't show them to people in the same way. So for me, they were learning exercises. Uh. And stuff I made back then, I probably wouldn't show to much of anybody right now. Important for me creatively, but not so much important for anybody watching them. And after my time in New York ran its course, I went back to Albany and I uh, went back to school for journalism, got this journalism career going, yeah. and was able to 
build from that into my first two books. The first one was about the screenwriter Dalton Trumbo, so you can start to see the through line. Oh, I see. So you were writing about Dalton Trumbo when you were in Albany. Yes. Well, did you know anyone connected with Trumbo? No. There's a good story there, and this is a good educational experience for anyone who tries to get into the arts, which is I, in that period of time, had a column in two newspapers, uh, one of which I was editor of and one of which I was the arts editor of. So, oh, so there I, were two newspapers in Albany? There were probably about six. That's fantastic. But everyone, everyone puts together a career. <laughs> right. And culled from that, I had different columns that collectively right. represented what I had to say about where film was at at that time. And this is going into the late 90s. I put those essays together oh. in what I hoped would be a wonderful and fabulous book that everyone would want to read. And while it may have been wonderful and fabulous, it turned out everybody didn't want to read it. So, But that's what happens with journalists. I mean, we write stories and we see this big body of work and, uh, you know, a publisher says, oh, this is great, let's put it together. And then it either goes or it doesn't go, I guess, right? You don't and know who's reading it when it's in the newspaper. Absolutely. And it ended up following a, a good path for me, which is I put together this book of essays, took it to um, publishers, couldn't find a home for it because, of course, I didn't have a name to put on the cover that was going to sell copies. And the publisher I uh, built the best relationship with, an academic publisher in North Carolina called McFarland and Company, said, we can't publish this because we don't think we know how to sell it, but if you have a single subject that you would like to explore, we'd love to publish that for you. Oh, is that right? So that's when you got into Dalton Trumbo? Absolutely. Hollywood the, Rebel? Yep. And you got awards for this? and It was a finalist for the National Theater Library Association Award. I'm really proud of that. That's fantastic. And they've reprinted it? They have. It's in paperback now. Now, I saw a documentary on Dalton Trumbo. Was it anything that you wrote? Was it from your book? I make a fleeting appearance in it as one of the <laughs> gallery of people who have either oh. studied Trumbo's work or know him. They did interviews, right? It yep. was a lot of interviews. One of which was me. And then, of course, the other aspect of that movie that's really exciting are his correspondence being read by movie stars, which uh -huh. is an interesting creative approach to getting his, his, uh, his artful language and also his political statements out into the world. Did they do a stage play, too? They did. They the did. Stage... I saw that, too. One yep. person, right, reading letters? It's the stage play is actually written by his son Christopher, who I know. Yeah. And there's two characters in the play. One is sort of a cipher playing Christopher receiving the letters. I see. And then the other is the star of the show, who in different performances has been everyone from Steve Martin to Nathan Lane to Joe Mantegna. I saw Nathan Lane. Mm -hmm. did playing you, trombone. Did you um, have any problems with the family when you wrote your first book on him? No, and it was interesting. Uh, Christopher Dalton's son has sort of taken the lead among the three children as the person who protects the father's legacy. So he was incredibly generous in reading manuscripts, reading early versions of my book, correcting errors of fact, pointing me toward places where I might be able to find information, but at the same time being very respectful that my job writing this book, which was a critical survey, was to offer my interpretation of Trumbo's career, not the gospel according to the family. Yes, because I would think that he's a writer. He is. And he, he would want to do the same thing that you were doing, which, of course, he did on stage, right? And he's always talked about doing a book himself, which I would love so, to read. Yeah. Um, from there, we go to the cinema of Generation X. Was that a big film or a small film? That was my second book. That was your book. And what did was it go into film? It did not. Oh, so it was okay. But it was about film. So it was about film. Okay. <laughs> same difference. And that was exciting for me because, as a real student of the 1970s filmmakers, Bogdanovich, Lucas, Coppola, etc., I saw that a lot of academic research and a lot of popular entertainment uh, journalism had been done about looking at that group of people through a generational prism. What about oh. their shared experiences defined their work? And I thought, well, someone could do that to my generation, and since I'm the person who thought of that, it should probably be me. How did you How did you approach it then? It's a critical survey, so what I did is I looked at the history of people in my peer group. What were the shared societal experiences? From, from your age to the to the back age, right. I see. We were growing up during Watergate. We were going up during the drugging of children. We were going up during the expansion of the divorce rate, changing of social mores, I see. and that manifests in a kind of anarchistic worldview that you see in everyone from Quentin Tarantino to yeah. Kevin Smith. 
I, I'm going to jump over every little pixel tells a story, which sounds really interesting to me because I want to get into tales from the script, which is like tales from the script. I'm like thinking, did I say this right? Did I read this right? And this is your book on 50 Hollywood uh, screenwriters. Did you interview them? Sure did. The goal of this project was to create a book and a movie that collect the experiences that every screenwriter will undergo throughout their career. So the idea was to speak with a spectrum of people, everyone from people who are just beginning their careers to people who have Oscars on their mantelpieces. And what I wanted to do in terms of the fabric of the piece, both for the book and the movie, is to create a panel discussion as if these people were all in a room having a conversation oh, with each other. How do you do that? It's through careful editing and, of course, that's my journalism experience coming out because oh, a lot of what you do as a journalist, as you know, is amassing a lot of source material and then distilling it down to the most efficient delivery device possible. So does that go on the screen the same way? Absolutely. So that when you watch the movie, which opens in New York on March 12th and in L.A. on March 19th before and coming out on DVD in April. I was going to say you'll, you can buy it on DVD then yep, at you the can, end you too. Can, yeah. You can all get all the information the on the, the project year. at the project's website, which is talesfromthescript.com. Yeah. But in both the book and the movie, the experience that I wanted the reader and the viewer to have was that they were sitting in a room with all of these greats who have come before them. Well, how did it's you, as if they're just sharing stories. How did you get them all? Was, was it difficult? Some were more difficult than others, but oddly, the people at the very top of the food chain were in some ways the easiest to get. So I always like to tell the story about approaching the legendary William Goldman, uh, the two-time Academy Award-winning screenwriter of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and All the President's Men. And it was as simple as placing a call to his agent here in L.A. And five days later, I had got a voicemail message from Bill saying he'd be happy to do it. Bill, your good friend Bill Goldman. <laughs> my, good fr my good friend Bill. And the only reason I feel comfortable doing that and don't feel pretentious doing that is that that is how he prefers to be introduced and, and that's how he has to be referred. So. Is there a moderator in the film? No, I really wanted the people to tell their own stories. And that's something that comes out of my journalist, journalism experience is I like to be invisible in the process. I don't like it to be about me telling someone else's story. I yeah. want them to tell their own story. But you've acted before, and you could have been the moderator, because I think you've done voiceovers, haven't you, in that uh, I've done realm? I've, I've done some acting in the same way that everyone does who goes on a directing track, which oh, is yeah. you, you do some <laughs> acting training, you act in other people's films. It's nothing that I would celebrate as one of my great accomplishments. <laughs> so, But your voice, you, you just decided to have them tell the story. I am not a big fan of narration if it's avoidable, mm. because I think it steers the story too much in, in one direction. And I think it's much more powerful to let the people who are in this project tell their own stories. So um, Grand River Films is your company. My company. And it, and it uh, distributed what? Every, no. Uh, Grand is River it Film deriver, distributing this, no. Tales from the Script? I'm very happy to say that the book is from HarperCollins. Right. And the movie is being distributed by First Run Features. That's right. And then tell us about your uh, company that you started. Sure. Grand River Films is my own production company. So I do some web content through there. I do some oh, journalism content through there. I do script consulting. It's sort of a catch-all for the different services that I perform. And, of course, Grand River becomes part and parcel of any of the larger projects that I do. I see. What's in the future? What do we have? Do we have another uh, Tales from the Script? I'm actually presenting a nonfiction book to publishers as we speak, a follow-up book. So we'll see where that goes. Same and kind of thing. Have you done all the interviews? Oh, you have to wait till you see if it's approved. Right. So that's new. <laughs> that's new. Go, yeah. And the other thing that's in the in the hopper for me that I'm really excited about is I'm putting together a fiction feature that I'm going to write and direct called The Eulogist. I'm working with producers oh, now and, yes. and raising money. So with any luck, that'll be in theaters in a couple of years. What kind of story is that? It's a dramatic story. It's uh, because I'm a writer and because writing is my strength, I wanted to come up with a character who led with language. And I oh, think a story, a character-driven story that's about the beauty and the power of language is, I think, something that can fill a niche that's not really occupied, occupied right now in the marketplace. Have you cast it in your mind? I have, but it's pointless to even talk about that <laughs> because... The perfect person for the for any of these parts is the person who wants to do it and can do it. And the performance that you imagine with a movie star is really nothing more than something that helps you write. 
So that's, that's the best way to look at something like this. Yes, the, the package that comes together is the best package because mm -hmm. that's the package that got it into the world. Well, we've got you, we've got your package, we've got your tales from the script. We, have, we know everything about you now, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. We'll be right back with Philip Anthony Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm really happy to be here with actor Philip Anthony Rodriguez, who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He studied theater and dance at SUNY Purchase, and you've seen him in TV series, on the big screen, and at the theater. He made uh, his award-winning debut in Buddy, The Buddy Holly Story on Broadway. Actually, it was award-nominated, but that's okay. That's, oh, winning, we'll give it I to you. I won in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it to you. We want you to win. Sounds He's good. He's a member of an improv group called Sal Soul Comedy, and is a voiceover artist. Um, Philip is a Pisces too, like oh, me. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, oh, so here we are. Good. Where do we start? I know you've done a lot, mm -hmm. but I think one of the last things you did was Waiting for Yvette. That's right. A short film, mm -hmm. and it was directed by our good friend Justin Ross. Who's also my very good friend. <laughs> so tell us about uh, what, what went into this. Uh, well, you know, the, I, it, the story is about a, um, uh, a pre-op transsexual who is having second thoughts about, you know, or, you know, kind of a confrontation within herself as to how she wants to go and how she wants to deal with her, some of her closest friends. And they get together for sort of like this group, this sort of like AA group of... <laughs> and, and this... this Steve turned Yvette is right. played by Wendy, Wendy Malick, Malick. Yes. fantastic actress, wonderful actress. How Very does funny. she feel about playing a role like that? I mean, it's one thing to play a gay role, but it's another thing to play something where you have to change sex. E exactly. Well, clearly, uh, you know, <laughs> Wendy Wendy comes across and and is uh, an actor, just like all good actors who really embrace a challenge. And that's that's pretty much what she did. Um, she's not she's not afraid of accepting a challenge like that, and of course she did brilliantly in in, in the uh, in the film. Um, there was that instant connection, and you really believe that she's having this sort of like battle within herself as to am I making the right decision? Am I doing the right thing? And uh, she takes to it very well. Well, one thing, your role, mm -hmm. you you're, you play a policeman. Yeah, and. I, I looked at you and I went, oh, he's so buff. How much do you work out? Uh, not as much as you would think. <laughs> you mean it's just natural? Yeah. Well, no, sometimes, no, I do. I have to keep in shape, but sometimes I get a little lazy. You know, the, the schedule gets busy, but, you know, I, I maintain myself pretty fit. So this is only a 13-minute film, mm -hmm. and we've been talking about it practically for 13 minutes right. because there's so much to talk about. Yeah. But, um, how did Justin come to it, Justin Ross? Well, uh, Justin got involved with it with uh, Deborah Pearl, uh, who's the original writer. And from what I understand, oh. it was originally uh, going to be a one-act play. And that's actually what, what Wendy had sort of signed on to do. She, she liked the idea oh, that this would I be a see. stage play and stuff. And then I'm not really sure how it came about that they were going to make it into a short film which as it turns out was a better decision because it did very well. It was in, in uh, oh, it won a lot, the, yeah, a lot of Palm studio Springs. awards, Palm Springs, uh, the film festival there. So, But it, short films are so trendy now, aren't they? I was they just really talking are. about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do very well. Um, and uh, It's surprising. Yeah. And some people say they make a short film because it's an intro to making the full feature. Exactly. Do you think that's what uh, Justin wants to do? I, yeah, I, would, I would think so, and yeah. And then would you be cast, you'd all be cast in your same roles? If I'm, if I'm fortunate enough to do so, then I'm <laughs> truly blessed. Uh, it would be fun to, to work again with Justin and, and that wonderful cast. So, Did yes. you know the cast members before? Not at all. I How'd you get cast then? I just went through the normal process that most actors these days go to. You know, I got sent a script, I got sent some sides, 
come into this appointment. We want you to meet with the director and the producer, as well as the screenwriter. I read for them. Uh, I had an instant rapport with them, and then uh, I was lucky enough to get that call a few days later. Would you like to be part of the cast? I said, absolutely. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we've got to go to Broadway. Broadway. This is really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, you do sing and dance. I'm Did a singer. You, well, yeah. actually, when I was in high school, I went to a program called Town to Limited at my high school in New York City. And, you know, my first love was, was theater. You know, Talent been, Unlimited? Is Talent that Unlimited. Said? It was a special program that was geared towards inner city kids. And I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. So when, when they had auditions, it's not unlike, you know, the School of Performing Arts, but this is more of like a conservatory style setting. Uh, the program. But so, how did you get there from I just, being Brooklyn and inner city and all that? How did you find it? When I was 10 years old, a theater group came into New York called Acting by Children. And that was my first introduction to theater, acting, and what have you. Oh. And one thing led to another, and I had heard about this program when I was grad. I went to Catholic school for eight years, which is probably why I'm the way that I am. Right. But anyway. <laughs> no, it's because you're a Pisces. <laughs> That's it. It's because I'm a Pisces. But uh, in any event, I, I, uh, that was the determination that I, that I had to, uh, to get into acting. It was, it was, I, I took to it instantly. It was so much fun. That's great. And, and then how, how hard was it to get on Broadway? My gosh. Oh, gosh. Well, was it your first well, kind of thing? Buddy was my first Broadway show. So it was a thrill. And, and it was a thrill on so many levels I can't even begin had to express. Had you been to, uh, going out for part? Yeah, uh, yeah, you'd yeah. Be good. <laughs> yeah. Well, like when I was in that school, um, I was a musical theater major, but I also did drama. So I was all already introduced at a whole musical theater world. Uh, so I <laughs> took to it very well. Buddy was a play with music. I see. So it wasn't technically a musical, but it had a lot of music in it. Did you sing in it? I did. I played Richie Valens who was oh famous gosh. for singing La Bamba. And you sang that? I sang that song every night for about 250 plus shows. That's, that is so great. It was And great. that show went to London. It actually it originated it. in London. Is that where it started? And we had our North American premiere in Toronto before we, uh, and we did some, a couple of tryout cities, uh, San Francisco, before we came to Broadway. You were in those? I was in those, yeah. Except for the London production. I did the London production after Broadway. It was sort of a weird sort of incestuous oh, you, then thing you going did go to, on. Then you did go to London? I did, and that was great. We did. I worked on the West End, and I was uh, living in London for probably about a year. So, so how great. old were you? I was a baby. Well, in, in relative terms, I was in my early 20s. With a big role. With that a was, big role. That's very Fantastic. exciting. And the great thing about it was, you know, being on Broadway is one thing. Uh, being at the Schubert Theater, which is a legendary, like, flagship theater of Broadway, was an even bigger treat. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we were the first show there after a chorus line had caught close for all those years. So it was kind of special. Yeah. Well, also, you sang Richie Valens. Mm -hmm. was, and did he... Speak Spanish because you speak Spanish. Well, here's the thing. Uh, the real Richie Valens actually didn't speak Spanish very well. Oh, in he fact, didn't? was he, the, he Spanish? Had a Spanish background? He was of Mexican American descent. Yes, That's he grew up in California. And your background? I'm Puerto Rican. So you're so you speak Spanish with a Puerto Rican accent. Yeah, it, among <laughs> other things, yes. <laughs> but I speak it fluently, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but you didn't speak it on stage. No, no, not for that production. So it was, uh, didn't you, call for it. But you were in other productions uh, that, where you did speak Spanish, other plays. Uh, what was it, Una Mujer? Yeah, it was, uh, uh, I did named another. Named Maria? <laughs> yeah. Una Mujer named. Four Guys Named Jose, and it yeah. was, uh, it was uh, a wonderful show that we did in New York um, on the theater scene over there. Uh, again, got wonderful reviews, it, uh, uh, won all kinds of awards, and we also did a, uh, an original cast album for, for was the... Was it bilingual? It was bilingual. And did you sing too? I Is did. that why the cast... I sang, danced, and, you know, shuffled my feet, everything that That's I could That's why you're in such good shape. My, my other, one of my favorite playwrights is Eduardo Muchado. Yes. And you've done his work... Uh, plays too. Yes. Uh, Eduardo is uh, an amazing playwright, such a, uh, uh, an intelligent writer. And yeah, it was an honor really work. working for him. And uh, again, that's a treat. I, I, I've had an opportunity to work some really good people, you know, either, you know, whether it's a director or a writer or a screenwriter. Very blessed in that regard. So you did this Spanish-speaking voiceover too. Were they just, were they in commercials? Oh gosh, yeah. I, you know, well, that's the bread and butter work for me. I, I do a lot of. You do, uh, do a lot. I of do that. a lot of voiceover work, and uh, what what are they? I think you you did a commercial for Expedia. 
Dot com. I, well, actually, that was an on-camera thing. I was, a, was, I was on a, camera. I was a spokesperson for Expedia uh, for about two years, which was a lot of fun. And and how did you look? I don't uh, remember. Dapper, the, very dapper. Did they have you in a suit? Oh yeah, I mean, really nice suit. They they spared no expense. I think I had a several thousand dollar <laughs> like Hermes Privé suit on. <laughs> so you know, I, I think Expedia has that kind of money. So it was kind of nice. Where did they shoot it? Uh, well, we shot all over. Initially, when the campaign started, we shot in the studio and green screen. And then uh, the client decided to really expand their horizon, so to speak. So uh, another year, we shot in South Africa, okay. in Mozambique, and in, and in other parts of Southern so Africa. So they were showing what oh, they yeah. really did, and they did it. Oh, absolutely. Honestly. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was like such a, such a treat to do that. And then, you know, to, to fly to, uh, to Africa. I mean, I'd been there to, to Africa and to South Africa before, but going back, it was even more amazing, especially nice when you go over there and you're getting paid. To you're getting it. paid, and you're a star <laughs> yeah. on a commercial. Oh, it's so so go back to the voiceovers. Do you do those in Spanish? I do. I do. I do both markets, the, you know, the English market, Spanish market. Um, oh, I was I, uh, I was a spokesperson for for Ralph Lauren for many years as well, doing their their romance uh, in Spanish. In Spanish, yes, yes. So they shoot a whole different set of commercials for the Spanish speaking market. Yes, they do. Yes, absolutely. And um, the comedy improv, which uh, is bilingual too, right? Do actually, you primarily too primarily English, but you know we had a lot of. Um, we had we, we would intersperse a lot of you know Spanglish as you would yeah, say. Yeah, tell me what that is. It's that salsa. Salsa comedy troupe. It was the uh, first original uh, uh, Latino improv group coming out of New York. We perform in comedy clubs all throughout the city, um, and in particular two famous ones uh, in Caroline's Comedy Club. You did. And also Rascal's Comedy Club, among others. Uh, the group was also involved with the Toyota Comedy Festival, which happens you know every year. It's a big festival where all kinds of comedians and Improv groups converge, so like upright citizens brigade and stuff like that. But do you speak to each other when you get? <laughs> do you get mad at each other and then speak in Spanish? Yes, do they we, all speak Spanish? Oh yes, we get into those fiery Latino tirades. You know, whenever they come across, <laughs> <laughs> you know how those Latins are. They just start sounding off on each other, and then all of a sudden they start. They start. It's like it's like some Ricky Ricardo tirade. Uh, you know, can, when can he's we screaming understand at Lucy. It? Can we understand it in the in you this can audience? In, in fact, <laughs> one of the one of the one of the most famous skits that we did was an entirely Spanish version of the Who's on First Routine by oh. Abbott and Costello. Oh, we well, did it entirely in Spanish. And even the English-speaking people, you know, who were familiar with the original Abbott and Costello piece, they didn't have to speak Spanish to understand what was going on, and they loved it. They thought it was a clever thing. They just kept thing. listening yeah, to well, that. Yeah, they, well, they, they, they got the rapport. They, they, they saw the connection. They saw the emotion that we were, you know, uh, instilling into the whole skit, and it was probably one of our best, most famous skits to this day. That's, how do you feel more comfortable, speaking in Spanish or speaking? Well, look at you speaking in English. <laughs> English is definitely my first language, but I'm fluent. I wasn't always good. I grew up in a bilingual household with my parents. You and know. did you speak Spanish as a child? Yes, I did. Oh, you yeah. did, because usually they don't want to speak. Kids don't want to speak the language of their parents. Right. No, no, we totally embraced it. And, uh, you know, I think by, I think being bilingual or multilingual for that matter is such, is such a wonderful benefit these days. But, uh, you know, I, I'm so not ashamed of my heritage. So What about, um, I think, did you do something at the public theater? Take were you in Take Me Out? I did Take Me Out. No, I did a production of Take Me Out with the repertory of St. Louis. Uh, oh, fantastic that's where it was. Yeah, and I played the lead, Darren Lemming, who what is, a play! It was fantastic. I and, saw it at the public theater. Oh yeah. Well, interestingly enough, and and not to take any anything away from the original public theater production, <laughs> oh, but we me. had but we had several people who were involved in that production. Uh, producers or otherwise who had either come to see it. We had a couple of people from that production uh -huh. do our production at the repertory, and a lot of them said that it was so good that they considered it the, the, the new definitive version of that play, which is, is like, Ooh, okay, I, you didn't hear that from me. I didn't say it, they did. <laughs> That's fantastic. Fantastic, isn't it? yeah. So you've really been busy in your career. I have, uh, knock on wood. It's been a blessing. It's <laughs> and, been great. And you've brought such insight to us today. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Joe. It's my <laughs> and pleasure. Thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Write to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But please continue your emails, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N, -N, the numeral one, at AOL.com. We'll see you next time.